listening to the Sermon Audio Podcast from Redeemer Lutheran Church and Pastor Paul Pett. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for our message is our gospel reading, and I'll read just a portion of that one more time. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. This is our text. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we ask, fill us with your Holy Spirit, fill our minds and hearts, that you would indeed clean us, purify us, make us holy. Help us to see what is the the truest and greatest priority that we have as a child of God. Our hearts are set and focused on that which is the most important and not on so many other things, so many other things that can overwhelm us, that can pollute our minds and overwhelm our hearts. Help us to draw back to you and walk with you, connect to you, and receive your grace. In your name, amen. So how do you know when something is or has become impure? How do you know? How do you know? And exactly, thank you so much. It stinks. Okay? How many of you have ever done this? Reach in the fridge for the milk. Right? You look at the label... Oh, I got a couple of days yet. But you unscrew the cap. You don't have a couple of days yet. It's probably nasty, stinky, and when you pour it, it comes out in chunks. Problem, right? How many of you have ever reached in the fridge for that piece of something that you really wanted as a leftover? but you let it go a little bit too long, and now it is no longer the color that it began. It was never supposed to be green, but now it very much is. Right? So I want you to get that kind of an idea as we're listening to our gospel reading. When does something become impure? When we recognize it's time to clean house. In the gospel reading, when Jesus comes into the temple, he notices something horrible. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now this is the first time during Jesus' public ministry that he did this. We know that Jesus did this from what we hear about him in Luke as uh, a young man or a 12-year-old where he went up to the temple and then he wandered off and they had to find him. But they started going and they did every year. This was his custom. But now seeing what's going on in the temple. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pinches and the money changers sitting there. You see, as a child, he had watched this. As a young man, he had watched this. Initially, these animals and these money changers were outside the temple, outside the temple walls, and then that's where they were selling them. But now they had brought them inside the temple walls into the court where there were colonnades and there was a porch where they could kind of be on uh, under those porches and out of the weather, and they were selling right inside the temple. Now, I want you to know that from time to time, we've had wildlife here in the church. If you were here in Christmas Eve a couple of years ago, our church mouse was running around letting us know He was coming to worship for Christmas. 
Every once in a while during choir practice, you guys get buzzed, right? We see a bat fly through the sanctuary. Now these things were not invited. These things were not let in. These things were quickly purged upon discovering their presence in the sanctuary. Totally different. When you're bringing the animals in, that's a problem. And so as we listen to this, Jesus is recognizing something is very bad. Because if you're bringing oxen in and you're bringing sheep in, and even if you're bringing pigeons in, and what goes along with them? Odors. Stink. Because oxen and sheep and pigeons aren't going to be polite and wait till they get outside to do their business. So what was the temple becoming? A bar. And therefore, it was becoming dirty, impure, desecrated. And that's what set Jesus off. That's what made him angry. That's not what God's house was for. Not to mention the fact that those who were selling the animals were selling them at not a premium price, but an exorbitant, outrageous price because, well, you were in the temple and you're not going to find them anywhere else nearby. Not to mention the fact that the money changers taking Roman money and changing it for temple money were charging a hefty exchange rate. In another place in the scriptures, Jesus says, don't make my father's house a den of thieves, recognizing what they were doing wrong. I want us to see that things were bad then. What's the danger for us? The danger for them was what? Something more important to them mattered more than God's temple. What was it? Greed, right, money, exactly. So they weren't worshiping God any longer. They were worshiping. How often does that occur in our day and time? I've had complaints about people who stopped going to church because said, all the church is interested in about money. I said, come, and you won't hear about money, and I guarantee you that until you feel better about being in God's house and it not being about money, don't give us a dime. Because being in God's house isn't about the money. Being in God's house is about what? A relationship. A relationship with God. You see, the temple was to be that place where God connected to his people, where God connected with those that were his. And when it was all about money or all about merchandising and all about this kind of stuff, they had lost their way. It had become polluted. It had become impure. It had become desecrated with all kinds of bad things. And so Jesus takes matters in his own hands, verse 15, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers. He overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered Read it with me, that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Did it? Did zeal for God's house consume Jesus? I want you to think about what words did they try to use against Jesus at his trial? Verse 18, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, read with me, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. 
What words did they try to use against him at his trial? Matthew records this. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. You think it had an impact on them? Were they mad about Jesus saying this or were they mad about something else? They were mad about the fact he overturned their tables, drove out the sheep and the oxen, and that's what they were mad about. And so they remembered that he said this is the reason. They remembered it because of their anger, not because of their repentance. And as they remembered this because of their anger, they sought a way to get revenge on Jesus for saying it. But it wasn't only at his trial, was it? A little further down in Matthew, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Here you the Son of God come down from the cross. So not only that, but they used it to mock him while he hung on a cross. That's the kind of impact it had. What was Jesus seeking to do on that cross? Say it again. Purify. Purify our hearts, purify our minds, purify our souls. Put up that next picture, Ben, will you? Know what this is? Does anybody have any idea what this is? Water, water purification. If you ever have a bottle of water and you're looking at the label and reading it just for fun, because I know we always do that, some bottles will say, purified by reverse osmosis. When they put a filter in between and it can be in the bad water and only good water comes back out to the other side by reverse osmosis. Now, if you say, did you learn anything at church today? Oh, yeah, we learned about reverse osmosis. But what's, what's happening is the old is being left behind and the pure is being brought in. The old is being left behind, and the pure is being brought in. Because what we need to see in Jesus is what? Purity. The purity of his righteousness, the purity of his life without sin, the purity of his holiness. And that holiness is not only the fact that Jesus was perfect without sin, but that holiness was the fact that Jesus was set apart to be holy for you and me, to be our Savior, to be our Redeemer. And so Jesus takes from us. He pulls out the bad and inserts the good. He gives us his purity. He gives us his holiness. He gives us all of that by the blood he shed on the cross. And as Jesus gives us all of that by the blood he shed on the cross, he is making us that which we could not make on our own. Pure, holy, and new again. Because the fact is what? We're all impure. We're all unholy. We all have desecrated ourselves in one way or another. But the blood of Jesus Christ, do you remember the words? Cleanses us from which sins? And because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, he wants even more for us. Because remember the quote, go back to the gospel reading again, and Jesus' words to those Jews 
in 19, destroy this temple and in three days I will. Jesus wants to give us over and above, purifying us, cleansing us, making us holy. He wants to give us new life. I want to show you another picture. Ben, if you would. Can you get a good picture of that? Can you see that? There on the left is an absolutely polluted waterway, uh, absolutely desecrated landscape. On the right, they've removed all the bad and cleansed it. And what's now taking place? New growth again. So on the other side, a mess. On this side, new life, new growth, new health to that waterway. And what we need to see in there is that's exactly what Christ does for us. He takes that which is destroyed, polluted, condemned, and he makes that new again. He gives new life out of his resurrection. And so when we hear Jesus say, destroy this temple, he destroys himself, allows himself to be destroyed, to take away our sins, and he raises up again in three days to give us new life. All of it we are benefiting from because now we connect to him. Who's the temple? Who's the temple? Jesus is. Purified, holy, where we can connect to him. Connect to him as our Savior, connect to him as our Lord, connect to him as our King, to get, connect to him as the one who has risen from the dead and gives life to us. You're going to face times where you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, not because of a physical appearance, but because of a sinful, guilt-ridden, shame-filled life. There's only one who could clean it for you. Right? And once he has, you're pure and holy. Trust in him. Connect to him for that cleaning. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Spirit may abide with us all. Amen. Thanks for listening. At Redeemer Lutheran Church, our mission is to share with all people the good news of Jesus Christ, teaching faith and love. Learn more about our ministry at RedeemerLutheranGB.com.